Okay, hi everybody. I am Sue Dangena, Sue Director of Marketing for Synchro Software. Thanks for joining us today. Our webinar today is Tips for Working with Large Models. And um, just a couple quick notes here. Hopefully you all know that Synchro Pro 2016 was released this week. You can request the update from our website on the downloads page. And on February 18th, Greg Demchek, our Director of Product Management, is uh, presenting a webinar to review the new features. You can register for that webinar from our homepage as well. It's on the um, lower right-hand side. And I just also want to let you know that we also have a number of uh, pro training courses scheduled in both London, Berkeley, and in Boston in the coming months. And you can get details on those one and two day courses on the home page of the website. Um, some of those are getting quite full, but I think there's space in most of those left. Um, today's webinar is being presented by Mazen Falawi. Mazen is part of our project delivery team in Berkeley. He has a master's degree in civil engineering and construction management from UC Berkeley and we are recording the session. Uh, we also encourage you to submit questions in the questions panel throughout the webinar. So thanks again for joining us, and uh, Mazen, you're ready to get started. Thanks, Sue. So there's a lot to cover today in this webinar, and I'm gonna try to go as fast as I can so it can cover everything. So some of the tips will be related to importing and setting up your model, and then other tips will be related to how to work in your model. So the first tip, if you haven't already done so, is to request the update for Synchro 5.2, which is Synchro 2016, and update your Synchro because this there are so many improvements, particularly related to 3D view and model file size. For example, this model right here, the structural component of it used to be 92 megabytes, and just saving it as a 2016 format turns it down to 26 megabytes and makes it much faster to navigate. Um, also, this will allow you to import as many user fields and model parameters without overcrowding your model. The second tip will be related to importing models as well. This second tip mostly applies to oil and gas type projects and power plant projects. I wasn't using this tip on this particular model. And it's to import limit the 3D tree while importing your models. So what this does is that if you look at the 3D right here, there are so many levels and in power plant type projects, sometimes even the bolts and nuts of each pipe system will be modeled as a separate object. And setting the, the tree to limit on import will basically merge everything below a specific level that you specify. And then each pipe will be considered as one element a lot joined with the nuts and bolts uh, attached to that pipe. The third tip related to importing models is to import trades and sometimes even part zones of the model separately. This way you'll be able to synchronize separately and then you'll be able to load and unload specific parts of your model to make your model navigation faster and easier. Now we'll be diving into um, tips that are related with working with the model. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is using cutting planes to just uh, hide some parts of the model that you're not working on right now. If you export using a Revit plugin, then you'll have automatically generated cutting planes at each grid level grid line from Revit. So this is a Revit export, and as you can see right here in the Navigator cutting plane sections, I have all these cutting planes preloaded automatically. And I can activate, for example, level 14 top, and then level uh, 11 bottom, and then narrow down my model to that specific range. And I can create in synchro vertical cutting planes to separate the zones. I'm going to deactivate those cutting planes so we can go back and see the whole model. Now I'm going to be talking about using 3D sets. So once you use the load and unload features from the 3D tree to narrow down your model to one specific trade, and this model, for example, I've only imported one trade, which is the structural concrete and structural steel you can start using 3D sets. And there are different types of 3D sets you can use. 3D sets are basically filters for the 3D view, and filters will be for the tasks. You can use the same as task filter, so if you've used a task filter, then filtering the 3D sets, if uh, filtering the 3D if your model is already linked, will only show the resources assigned to the tasks that you have filtered. But now I'm gonna use a parametric filter, which is a filter related to the user fields 
imported from Revit. So if you're not familiar with user fields, I'm going to click on any element right here. And you'll go to 3D properties, user fields, and you'll see all the parameters that have been imported from Revit. Now some of these I don't necessarily use, and some of these I use for auto-matching and filtering. For example, I can use the phase filter, phase parameter, which indicates when the uh, phase created of the object and phase demolished if applicable. But mostly I'm going to be using the base level, which says level 6. And in my parametric filter, which is a 3D set because it's a 3D filter, I set up a user field filter. And I can search for the user field that has the word level in it, in this case base level or level. And I can set star 10. This, mean, this is a wildcard, which indicates that anything that comes before 10, so if the string indicates level 10 or LVL 10, or L10, it won't matter. What will be taken into consideration is just 10. And then I can activate this user field and filter my models to just the elements that belong to level 10. And then I can even change that value to, for example, 14. And it'll filter all this stuff in level 14. Now, I don't necessarily have to activate these filters to use them. I can just simply right-click and select filtered objects and then assign these to a task and then update the value select filtered objects again without necessarily activating the filter and assign to a task. But now I'm going to talk about something else which is a different type of 3D sets which I call working filters. And for this example I'll go to the 3D objects tree. If the 3D tree is too large and hard to navigate you can always right click collapse all and then expand the tree one by one. In this example, I'm going to hide everything, unload everything, and then let's just work with the structural columns. And I can basically create a working filter that I'm going to use throughout the project by just selecting, right-click, filters, create filter from selected, and let's call this working filter. So this automatically created the 3D set called working filter, which I can activate. And then let's say I'm going to be working on just this part of the model. I can just select whatever is here and then right click filter, remove selected from filter. And this removes what I've selected from my current filter and I can always go back and add it. Or I can use, if you can look at here, the short keys for add selected to filter, control shift S and then room, remove selected from filter. So if I, I had control shift D, these will be removed from my filter. And now let's focus, for example, on this one. Let's say this is section one. And I've created enough tasks uh, right here just to show the examples that I'll be showing. Now, for these, type, for these elements, if I look at the user fields, there's something I can use, which is called base level. And then in the task names, there's level 01, base level 08. So I can basically use this to auto match, which makes working with large models much easier. So all I have to do is select section one, and then select the corresponding tasks in section one of my schedule, and then go to auto matching, and then set up a rule to use only the selected resources, only the selected tasks, many to many, and then the user field base level and to match to a substring of the task name. And then I hit OK, search, and assign all. And then you'll be able to see that as I move the focus time, the columns are being built. Now let's go back to the concept of working filters. I've just assigned these to tasks and I don't want to see them anymore in my working filter so that I won't get overcrowded with a 3D objects. Simply hit Control Shift D and they're removed from my working filter. And now I can go back to section 2, do the same, assign everything in section 2, then remove them from working filter. And let's say when I'm done, I can go to 3D objects. If it's too large, hit collapse all, and then expand, and then maybe add something else, maybe the floors, and Control shift s will add them to my working filter, and I can work with these. And that's pretty much everything I have to cover about 3D sets uh, in terms of working filters and parametric filters. But of course, you can dig down 
and see that you can filter by resources, by company, if you have different companies set up, or by name, and there are many options. And these options can be even used more by using the same as task filter. So once you set up a task filter where you also have many options, you can apply the same filter to a 3D set. And now I want to talk about something we haven't talked about. So let's remove everything from my working filter, Control shift d and then go back to the 3D objects. Um, for this example, I'm going to use the structural foundations. So I'm going to add them to my working filter, Control shift s um, This is more than I'd like to see in my working filter, so I'll just box select all of these and hit Control shift d and then box select all of these and hit Control shift d again. And let's say I want to focus on this, this specific set of foundation piles. This is a number placed for reference, so I'll go ahead and remove that from my filter. Now these are individually assigned to a resource, but let's say when I want to assign them to the task piles, I don't want them to be assigned as individual resources each, so I want to go, go ahead and select all of them and group them into one resource, and then so I can set up a growth profile to see them grow individually and make my construction sequence clearer in terms of the directions I want the work to progress in. So I can select all of these, hit Control shift r I'm going to assign them to a new resource, and let's call this Piles Section 1. And I'm not going to build tree. And here you can see that all of these were assigned to individual resource, and I'm going to have to unassign them. And this will explain two concepts I want to talk about with working with large models. The first is that when you group large, uh, a big set of objects into one resource, you're saving space. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and collapse all the resource tree, and then look for my newly created resource piles section one. Let's say I want to assign it with a growth profile to the piles task. And now as I zoom in on the Gantt chart and slowly move the focus time, I can see them grow as a group from the back to the front. But then another thing that's related to, you don't have to do this every time, but it's best practices to do this, is that when I unassigned all of these piles from their resources, I now have empty resources which do not have any 3D assignments in them. And these can overcrowd big models. So what I can do is, and this is a new feature in 5.2, is to use the resources tree, the resources tab, and then go to the 3D tab, which indicates how many 3D objects are assigned to each resource, and then click on the arrow, set up a custom filter to show all the resources that have less than one 3D assignment, which means zero. I didn't type zero because uh, it's actually a blank field, so less than one would work. Now you see that some of the resources come in with, with many objects. These are This is because these are parent nodes and they'll still show up. So all, all I have to do is select the resources that don't have any 3D assignments, scroll all the way down, be sure to not select inadvertently any parents that have 3D assignments or any parent nodes, and then right click, remove, and in this way I'm cleaning up my model from all the resources which don't have 3D assignments. And this is recommended to be done, for example, at the end of the day, at the end of your working session. But always be careful to not inadvertently select something like this, which is a parent, and delete a resource that you may not want to delete. Right-click and remove. And you do this for the rest of the model. So now I think we've covered everything I wanted to talk about uh, using about how to use 3D, big 3D models, and we have two minutes left for questions. Thank you, Mazin. Uh, you got, feel free, everyone, to submit questions if you have them. I know uh, Mazin went through that quickly, and he's a whiz at this, so if you need him to uh, re repeat or um, help with any additional detail, let us know. In the meantime, um, I just want to quickly mention that we also, at the same time we rolled out Synchro Pro 2016, we rolled out the new Synchro Academy, which is an online resource for all things Synchro. Um, you can request to enroll within uh, Synchro Pro on the homepage, or you can send uh, me an email or any of us and we'll get you enrolled and um, you'll have access to lots of updated training videos, some best practices, uh, workflows that the project delivery team and Mazin have participated in creating, 
and uh, some other uh, great articles and, and resources which can be tracked on your dashboard uh, individually and as a company if you're a corporate client of Synchro. So do check that out. Uh, there's lots of great stuff on there. And here is a question. What if model modified in Revit shall linking to be redone again in Synchro? Uh, I think any Synchro user knows that this is not true because you can synchronize. So all you have to do is go to the external data tab and this will show all your imports. And then you can right click synchronize from. And as long as the unique IDs have not changed, this means that the elements have not been deleted and recreated, everything should work. Uh, I can also talk about one more tip is that once you have many external data populated, if you're deleting models that you don't need, it may be a good idea to delete the external data entry so you won't keep the link active and you won't keep Synchro looking for that link. Thank you, Mazen. And, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us. If you think of questions uh, after the webinar, please do get in touch with us. Um, we'd love to hear from you.